So the next hadith is the hadith of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu as well. This is one of the longest hadith in the sunnah of the Prophet. And this is basically within the sunnah like Surah Al-Fatiha is within the Quran. And that's why some of the ulama of Islam like Al-Qurtubi, he said that this hadith is called, should be called the Umm sunnah the mother of the sunnah. The mother of the sunnah. Now what does the word mother mean? Actually, many, many years ago, me and Sheikh Jibreel, we wrote an article on the word mother. It's a 20-page article on the word mother itself and all of the different connotations of it. Uh, you should be able to find it on academia. I think it was published in 2010 or something like that. Because the word mother doesn't, necess <coughs> doesn't necessarily mean <coughs> mother alone. It means the origin. It means the foundation. These are some of the meanings of the word um. But if you want to get all of the meanings of the word um, then you can refer to this article that I'm referring to. Uh, and if you want, I can inshallah look, look it up and, and try to send it as well. So anyways, generally speaking, Imam Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Umm sunnah that this hadith should be graded as Umm sunnah What does that mean? As we have within the Qur'an, the Umm Al-Qur'an, Surah Al-Fatiha, the foundation of the Qur'an, the basis of the Qur'an, the mother of all surahs of the Qur'an, meaning the surah which entails all of the major meanings within the Qur'an, similarly all of the major meanings of the sunnah can be found within this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. <coughs> so the Prophet ﷺ was sitting around one day, as he used to habitually, specifically in the morning time. Most likely this event of uh, Jibreel coming happened in the morning time. This call, hadith is also called the Hadith of Jibreel. After the Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ had a practice of going to visit his wives and after he would visit, uh, visit his wives, he would go back and he would sit and now the Prophet ﷺ would take the opportunity to answer the questions of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and the uh, delegations that would also come to the Prophet. Most likely, this occurrence that we're, we're about to study happened in this Fajr halaqa, you can call it. Or the Fajr majlis. It wasn't a halaqa, it was more or less a majlis gathering. So Umar says, as we are sitting around the Prophet, that a yawmin, in one of these days, إِذْ طَلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلٌ شَدِيدُ بَيَاضِ الثِّيَابِ And you got to memorize this hadith, by the way. It's, it has all of the major meanings of Islam within it. When... Suddenly a man, he came about and he was we wearing clothes which were very, very white. And that shows you that it's a good practice to wear white clothing. The Prophet ﷺ used to love white clothing. And he used to say, إِلْبَسُ الْبَيَاضَ مِنَ الثِّيَابِ <coughs> Wear white clothes. And he would say, وَكَفِّنُوا فِيهَا مَوْتَاكُمْ And also place your deceased as well in the white cloth as well. When you're going to be placing them within the graves, place them within a white cloth as well. So this was one of the uh, things that the Prophet ﷺ would encourage, white clothing. Also because the, the reason is because if there's any filth on a white cloth, it can immediate, immediately be noticed. Whereas uh, in other colors, you might not be able to notice it. So he was wearing white cloth or white clothes. And there was a contrast. Along with the white, there was the here of his which were very dark black. So the contrast was there. Shadidu bayad al-thiyab. Shadidu sawad al-sha'ar. Very dark black hair. La yura alayhi athar al-safar. You could not notice any sign of the fact that the person happens to be a traveler. Wala ya'rifuhu minna ahad. And no one amidst us knew of this individual. Hatta jalasa ila al-nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Until he came and he sat before the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. فَأَسْنَدَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَىٰ رُكْبَتَيْهِ Then he took his knees and he put them completely directly across from the knees of the Prophet such that they were almost touching each other or they were touching each other. 
And then he took his hands and he put them on the thighs of the Prophet. And what he means by the thighs is the knees as found in another hadith. Okay? So, وَقَالَ يَا Muhammad, And he said, O oh, Muhammad, أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ Tell me of Islam. Tell me about Islam. <coughs> فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وتقيم الصلاة, وتقيم الصلاة وتؤتي الزكاة وتصوم رمضان وتحج البيت إن استطعت إليه سبيلا Of course this hadith is the hadith of Umar. There is another hadith of Abu Huraira as well. Uh, which is slightly variant but generally the same. So he said that Tell me of Islam. So this is the first question this man is asking the Prophet ﷺ. And this man is coming as a questioner. Okay, that's very important. As a questioner, look at the adab of this questioner. First of all, he's dressed well. Secondly, he's well kempt, meaning he doesn't look like he's all, you know, uh, he just came out of a travel or a jog or he's kept himself really well. <laughs> On top of that. <laughs> He's very brave. Because in some of the traditions of the Prophet, actually what the Sahaba had done is they had a special chair for the Prophet ﷺ. A dukkan they called it. Which would basically mean a slightly raised area. So they had a special raised area for the Prophet ﷺ. Slightly, not very much. And that would mean that this is the leader of this gathering here. So from that, by the way, the ulama of al-hadith, they also mentioned from that, we can take that it's okay for a scholar or a teacher to be sitting in a distinct chair from the students so that if there's an oncomer, they can recognize that if I have a question, he's the person to ask. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in a slightly distinct way. And this person knew that this is the leader of this particular gathering here. He goes up to the Prophet ﷺ and he sits right before him. Normally if you have a leader sitting in the front and there's a lot of people in front of him, you know, it would take a very daring individual for him to come over there and go right to the leader. Or go right to the person who's leading the gathering. Right? So that's exactly what happened. This person was quite daring, so he went right and sat right before the Prophet. What's important about this is when you have a question, then haya needs to be thrown out of the door. Shyness needs to be thrown out of the door in that, in that circumstance. You need to be daring to have your questions clarified. You need to be willing to express your question very, very clear, clearly. You cannot mince your words with the question. If your question hasn't been answered, ask again. As you'll see, <coughs> this questioner will keep on asking the Prophet ﷺ, right? By the way, I forgot to add, he actually came in and said, Salam, it's not in this tradition. But in some of the other traditions, he said, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Muhammad. He said, Assalamu alaikum. Then he looked to the, generally to everybody, he said, Assalamu alaikum. Then he said, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad. Because it's a general gath, uh, adab of a gathering that when you enter, you say, Assalamu alaikum. So even within Durus, if, you, if a dars is happening, if you're walking in, you say, Assalamu alaikum. Everybody should hear. And then you come in. So this is what. Uh, Jibreel alayhi salam also did or this man also did who later we'll find out is Jibreel and he asked the Prophet ﷺ, tell me of Islam the Prophet ﷺ mentioned a few things he said that that you bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship there is no true God worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no God within this existence. There's no true God worthy of worship within <coughs> this existence except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There may be people who believe other gods to be true, but they're not really true. That's why we have to add the clause within existence, within reality. In reality, there are no true gods except for Allah. In non-reality, meaning a person's a figment of a person's imagination, there may be people who they believe to be gods, etc. <coughs> so we say that there are no true gods within existence except for Allah. Wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Wa tuqim salat and that you establish prayer. The Prophet is describing Islam. He's saying 
that you bear witness to these two testimonies. By the way, there are two testimonies, not just La ilaha illallah, also Muhammadur Rasulullah. Got it? So the scholars of Islam say if you believe in one uh, and not the other, then you're not a Muslim. You have to believe in both of these. That's why it's very important if you have a person trying to accept Islam, make sure you tell them the entire testimony of faith. Don't tell them half of it, La ilaha illallah, and they've entered. No, La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. Another important factor here is most of the ahadith, <coughs> most of the ahadith, they say that they come with the word ashhadu. Okay? Most of the traditions, they come with the word ashhadu. So when you're helping someone accept Islam, the best way to do it is with ashhadu. But does that mean if you don't do it with ashhadu, the person has not accepted Islam? There is a difference of opinion among the scholars. I'm only mentioning this in this classroom or in this uh, lesson, but I don't believe that that difference of opinion is applicable. But for the purpose of care, I suggest that if you're actually going to be helping, you're giving da'wah to someone and they want to accept Islam, help them completely say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. As opposed to just la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. But this doesn't mean the person who didn't say La ilaha illallah, I'm saying for, ex for example that he's not a, not a Muslim. No, no. Even though there are some scholars, although I strongly disagree with this opinion, there are some scholars out there who believe this, but I really don't think such opinions should even be regurgitated. Because there are a hadith which actually have without shahada as well. There are a hadith in the sunnah that don't have the shahada. Uh, in which the Prophet ﷺ didn't mention the, sh the word shahada, just teach them, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Just say, La, and also, also the hadith of uh, Abu Talib. Ya am, oh my uncle, say, La ilaha illallah, kalimatun uhajju laka biha indallah. Say, La ilaha illallah, it's one word by, by which. I will be able to fight for you before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what's that? Did he say, say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah? No. And he's about to pass away. Right? So we say that it's enough to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Although, if you have the opportunity, then let them do the whole thing. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So we have to have these two testimonies of faith. The second thing is we have to establish prayer, <coughs> give our zakat, of course, if the zakat is due on you. Do you have to go out of your way to, by the way, earn money to give zakat? Some people, they want to actually earn money, save money just so they can fulfill this. This is kind of cute, mashallah. You don't have to though. Okay, this is kind of nice that you, you feel like, you know, I should fulfill every one of the five pillars of Islam. You don't have to though. The Prophet ﷺ never gave zakat. Although he told people to give zakat, but he never gave zakat. Why? Every time he would give money, get money, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he would distribute it in sadaqah. So you would never have a complete year of so much funds that would be zakatable. So the Prophet ﷺ never gave zakat. This means that if you have Money gives zakat, and if you don't, you don't have to go out of your way to earn simply for the fact that you want to fulfill this. <coughs> it's not obligatory upon you. And fast the month of Ramadan and do Hajj of Al Bayt. Now, of course, by Al Bayt over here we mean Baytullah Al Haram, and do the Hajj to the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In istata ilayhi sabila, if you're able to reach to the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Now. What's important here is, within the five, none of them, the Prophet wasallam, none of them did he make contingent on your capability except for Hajj. And the reason for that is because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make any of them contingent on capability except for Hajj. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Whoever is capable of going. Again, this is basically a way of consoling a person who's not able to go that look, yes, people are going for hajj. And sometimes people that really want to go and they can't go, they feel really internally bad. 
it's not an obligation upon you if you can't go. You don't have money or you can't physically uh, you know, bear the difficulty of traveling and uh, making your hajj. Don't worry, you don't have to go make hajj. It's not an obligation upon you if you're not capable of making hajj. Then after all of this, this question, what happens next? <coughs> well, what happens next is the man who came to the Prophet ﷺ, he says to the Prophet ﷺ, Sadaqt, you're speaking the truth. فَعَجِبْنَا لَهُ يَسْأَلُهُ وَيُصَدِّقُهُ We were shocked that he's asking the Prophet ﷺ and he himself is also saying, you're, you're right. I mean, normally a questioner, he would ask a question, he wouldn't say, you're right. He'd be like, okay, Jazakallah khair, Barakallah fiqh, something like that. But, uh, Sadaqt, you're right. So they, they were shocked at this. <coughs> then he asked a second question. And he said that, tell me of Iman. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him the pillars of Iman and tu'mina billah, believing in Allah, believing in the malaika, the angels of Allah, the books, believing in the prophets and the messengers, believing in the final day and believing in the divine decree, the hard divine decree and also the easy and comfortable and the sweet divine decree. The good divine decree, they're all, it's all good, but the, the angle of divine decree that people find sweet and the angle of divine decree that you might find bitter, that's for you or that is against you, believing in all of that. So this is part of a person's belief. Now, I should say that is there a difference between Iman and Islam then? When the two words come together, they're different. When they are separate, they can be used interchangeably. And that's why in the story of the Waftu Abdi Qais, the delegation that had come to the Prophet ﷺ from the modern day region of Al Ahsa or Al Hufuf or Hajar or what was sometimes called Al Bahrain as well. Not the current Bahrain, the old Bahrain. I gave you all the names for it, you can look it up. Okay, the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. Not all of it, but specifically these names. Hajar, Ahsa, Hufuf, or Bahrain. So this area, there was a group of people that had come from this area to the Prophet ﷺ to accept Islam. When they had come to ask the Prophet ﷺ about the basics of Islam and basically uh, accept Islam, and there was something unique about these people, they came willingly on their own accord without being da'wah sent to them. And some of the Sahaba, they actually traveled and they went to that area. And there's a masjid there called Masjid Juwatha, which is there. Now, by the way, you can travel to Saudi Arabia for tourism as well. So when you do, inshallah, you will go to this area and see this masjid called Masjid Juwatha. I've been there. And uh, this masjid was among the masajid. It's no longer used as a masjid. People just come to visit it as a tourist attraction. And people pray that are, who are coming there. But this was, the, this was one of the masajid that the Sahaba would pray in. وَالْمَسْجِدُ الثَّالِثُ الشَّرْقِيُّ كَانَ لَنَا وَالْمِنْبَرَانِ وَفَصْلُ الْقَوْلِ فِي الْخُطَبِ أَيَّامَ لَا مَسْجِدًا لِلَّهِ نَعْرِفُهُ إِلَّا بِطَيْبَةً وَالْمَحْجُوجِ ذِي الْحُجُوبِ That the third mosque out of the three mosques in the world was our mosque. And our mosque also had a member because there was a khutbah done there. There was a jumu'ah done there. Okay? So... That means that this was a very blessed area. The people did come to the Prophet around Dhuhrish time, right? And they had asked about Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ, one of the things he said, أَتَدْرُونَ مَا iman Do you know what Iman happens to be? So they're waiting for the Prophet to give the answer. The Prophet ﷺ gives them the five pillars of Islam even though he calls it Iman over here. Do you see? What that means is that Iman and Islam, when they're together, they end up adopting different meanings. But when they're separate, they end up, they can be used interchangeably in some contexts. <clears throat> That's why the Prophet himself, he described Everything related to Islam within this hadith of Jibreel as Iman within the hadith of Wafd Abd Qais. Got it? Okay. So, he says that these are the pillars of the belief. 
Then again, this companion, this individual, he says to the Prophet ﷺ, Sadaqt, you're honest, you're right, you're correct. So the Prophet ﷺ listened to him, but all of the Sahaba, they're again shocked. They're like sitting there, Why does, who's this man who's coming to our Prophet and asking him a question and telling him you're right? So he asked him a third question, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He asked him, Wa Alayhi Salam, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ or فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِحْسَانِ Tell me about Ihsan. He said, Ihsan is two things. That you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then as if Allah is watching you at least. So these are two different states. They're known as the state of mushahada and the state of muraqaba. The state in which you believe, it's as if you believe <coughs> that you are seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though you're not, within this realm, you will not get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَكِنْ انظُرْ إِلَى الْجَبَلْ فَإِنْ اسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ ف... فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِي Allah said to Musa alayhi salam, look at the mountain, if it stays in its place, then you will be able to see me. So the mountain didn't, didn't see, uh, stay in its place, and obviously that because of that he wasn't able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So this means that the that Allah cannot be seen within this world, but as if you are watching Allah. Now Allah's Messenger actually hinted towards this, as if the Prophet's worship was within the state of mushahada. Because he said, جُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ The coolness of my eye is within prayer. Because what do you watch with your eye, right? What do you see with your eye? So as if the Prophet ﷺ is hinting, saying that I adopt within my prayer that status of a worshipper who is at the highest status of Ihsan, who is a person who prays as if he's watching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before him. If you cannot reach to that, then at least reach to the next level down, which is as if Allah is watching you. Okay? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to have this level, where, as a bare minimum, where we always recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly and consistently watching us and He's, he's seeing us. And this is a level that is quite achievable if we try, and this is the bare minimum of ihsan. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asked by this man with another question. The next question was, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Tell me about the Day of Judgment. قال, he said, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The questioner, he doesn't have <coughs> any more, the, the questioned doesn't have any more knowledge about this issue than the questioner. Meaning, I don't know when the Day of Judgment will be. Okay? And I remember many, many years ago, a man had come over to my house and he had made a claim that... Um, that the Prophet ﷺ knows when the Day of Judgment will be. So I said, how does he know? He said that because the Prophet ﷺ said, and he was struggling with the hadith, I completed the hadith for him. Um, he said that because the Prophet ﷺ said something about the Day of... Now you, you know which hadith I'm talking about, right? بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَالسَّاعَةِ كَهَاتَيْنِ I was sent along with the Day of Judgment, like these two fingers. So I said to him, this doesn't mean he knows exactly when the Day of Judgment will be. I can also tell you, after I got the knowledge from the Qur'an and the Prophet Sunnah, that the Sa'a is very close. Allah told us of this in the Qur'an, that the Day of Judgment is very close. <coughs> but the fact that the Day of Judgment is close, doesn't mean the Prophet knows exactly when it is. And then I told him this hadith, that Jibreel alayhi salam, he came to the Prophet sallallahu and he asked him a question, tell me about the Day of Judgment. So the Prophet sallallahu said, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The person who's being asked doesn't have more knowledge on this issue than the questioner. Than the questioner, yes. So then Jibreel said, if you don't know about the hour itself, then tell me of the signs of this hour. Tell me about the signs of this hour. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned some of the signs. He said, "Antali dal amatu rabbataha," that 
the slave girl, she ends up giving birth to her master. What does this mean? The concubine or the uh, women within captivi captivity, she ends up giving birth to her master. Uh, people have explained this, by the way, in many different ways. But <coughs> we can say that, Wallahu a'lam, one of the ways that we can understand this hadith is that there will be a lot of disobedience to the parents before the Day of Judgment. How does that come about from this particular hadith? Well, and this is one of the explanations of this hadith as well. That before the Day of Judgment, the Prophet ﷺ actually told us in another hadith that before the Day of Judgment, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يكون الولد غيظا the day of judgment will not come until a child will become a calamity almost. Or a child will become very, very harsh towards his parents. Although this hadith is weak, but it matches the meaning within this authentic hadith in Bukhari and, and, and Muslim. That the Prophet is saying that a mother will give birth to a child and that child will act like the parent. And this is something that we can see today, where sometimes children, they start to behave like they're the parents. They know everything. They, do, they know what to do. They know what not to do. They speak to their parents in a way where, uh, when, and this happens generationally, by the way. I mean, you may say, I could never imagine speaking to my father like that. And then you hear your child speaking to you like that, right? The next generation is going to become even worse and so forth. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is that this form of uquq, where a person starts to feel so entitled that they pretend or they behave like they are the parents of their own parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from committing the sin of being harsh to our parents. Allahumma ameen. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he warned of this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us of this in the Qur'an. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that you do not worship anyone except for him and that you do ihsan with your parents. So with Allah, his own <coughs> rights, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the rights of the parents as well. أَن تَلِدَ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّتَهَا وَأَن تَرَ الْحُفَاةَ الْعُرَاةَ الْعَالَةَ رِعَاءَ الشَّيْءِ يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ And that a second sign of the Day of Judgment, and that a person who is hufat, who happened to be hufat, who's hafi, <coughs> what that means is a person who doesn't have shoes. Secondly, he's naked. Secondly, he's absolutely poor. He's ala, he's a'il. He's a shepherd of sheep. Such people with all of these qualities, they're naked, they're undressed, they are uh, without shoes, they are shepherds of sheep. Basically, the Prophet ﷺ is describing people from the deserts of Arabia. And suddenly they become what? يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ Suddenly, they end up having the tallest of buildings and they race to make sure who makes the larger building, one after another. And this is something that we can see today, isn't it? It's happening today. People who, you know, um, happen to be Bedouin Arabs, Within Arabia today, they went from being Bedouin Arabs to being some of the richest people in the world and now there's a race to who's going to make the tallest building as well. The Prophet Wasallam's description coming about completely as he said, يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ Racing to make the larger building. ثُمَّ انطلق, Then this man left. فَلَبِثْتُ And I waited for some time. Umar ibn Khattab said, after this man left, I sat there waiting for some time. <coughs> and then he said that, now finally, the Prophet ﷺ, he said to me, Ya Umar, O oh Umar, do you know who that questioner was? Do you know about that questioner? قُلْتُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَعْلَمُ He said, Allah and his messenger know best about who this questioner was. He said, that was Jibreel. He had come to teach you your religion. So what that means is the Prophet ﷺ, he described the entirety of this conversation as religion. Meaning, it's like the summary of religion. 
And that's why we say this hadith is like Umm Sunnah, just as Umm Al Kitab or Umm Al Quran is Surah Al Fatiha, because Surah Al Fatiha summarizes the general message within the Quran. I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to grant us the tawfiq to be able to understand and practice. And I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to grant us the ability to memorize this hadith. I encourage you, by the way, to memorize these hadith. It's completely possible. I know it looks like a task which is completely impossible. I'll give you a, a trick. All of you have long drives to work probably, right? And if you don't have a long drive, then take a long drive. <laughs> okay? But uh, all of you definitely have drives throughout your week. I'm sure of that. What you should do is you should take a recording of the 40 Nawawi, put it in your car, and listen to it again and again. As we're going through these ahadith, commit at least some of it to your memory. These are the words of your messenger. If you love the Prophet, then you'd at least remember the words. There are many people you love in your life and you... Actually, there are many people you hate and you remember their words. <laughs> Especially if you hate them, you remember their words, right? So, this is the Prophet, you love him. As a bare minimum, you can remember some of his words, okay? So I encourage you, Allahi, to memorize these ahadith, commit them to memory. And uh, honestly, if you put them in the car, you listen to them again and again, I think uh, all of 40 Nawawi could be read within 60, 70 minutes, maybe more, maybe less, depending on the speed. I'm sure that it will be just a few days before uh, you'll start to remember some of these words and some of these uh, terms. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again to grant us the tawfiq, to practice, to convey. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين